I hope you all enjoyed second half so far. Um, this is the last technical track for today. Uh, what I want to present today is actually real-time web communication, WebRTC. So who of you is actually familiar with WebRTC? Knows the technology? So my promise for today is I will make sure that you know the technology, what are the building blocks, and that have you uh, at least a grasp of what is the complexity in securing the technology. I will not do all the gray details because I think it's important to understand what WebRTC is and what's the impact on your organization, on your website, by deploying it. But I will make also sure that I show where are the risks in this uh, uh, technology. So my name is Lieven de Smet. I work at the university as a research manager on software security. I'm involved in OWASP and in SecRDF, as you see. Um, the work I will present today is actually some relevant sources that you actually can look up for more information. The first is actually a deliverable of a European project called Struis, and this is also the Struis logo that you'll see on my slides. We actually have been working in the last year together with people from SAP, W3C, and Trinity College ITF on assessing the security of the WebRTC technology. And this is actually a large document. I think it's around 70, 80 pages describing what we observed while assessing the specifications on WebRTC. A little bit more recent, there's also a special issue in internet computing, IEEE internet computing, which is actually focusing on what will be the next generation for security. What are the security challenges still remaining? How can we tackle those security challenges? And these are two relevant sources I'm using to actually present today what WebRTC is about. So to give you the best impression what WebRTC will do, let me just show you this video. The sound is not optimal because I don't have external speakers here, but if you're all a little bit quiet, we can understand what they are saying. Hi, it's Todd Simpson over at Mozilla. I'm going to show you the latest developments in WebRTC. Here you can see I'm just going to a web page, a web page that supports WebRTC. Uh, Firefox asked me for permission to use the camera and microphone, which I give it. And making a call over to our friends at Google. Hey Todd, how are you? I'm great, Hugh. How about yourself? Great. It's good to be making the call today between Chrome and Firefox using WebRTC. I think for the folks at home, I should start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Hugh Finnan, and I work on the Chrome Media team focused on WebRTC. Excellent. Yeah, and I'm Todd Simpson, Chief of Innovation over at Mozilla, and I love this type of innovation. Absolutely. It's great that uh, we can uh, now allow developers to create great applications using just JavaScript and the Google App Engine without the need for any plugins or extra software at all. Yeah, it's awesome. And the audio and video quality in this call is excellent as well. I know we're using BP-8 and Opus. And for the, the technically minded, we are have an encrypted call going as well with awesome. SRTP with DTLS on it, and we're going through firewalls using ICE, Stun, and Turn. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see what great applications using video and audio people will use with this technology. Okay, so why did I show you the video? So first thing, what did we see in the video? We actually saw the two uh, people participating in the call just using their web browser. So they didn't need any additional application, they didn't need any extension or plugin, just the core browser they're using is already capable of doing peer-to-peer -peer web communication. Another thing, there was some uh, discussion about uh, the, the codecs. I will not mention codecs any further in this uh, talk, but there have been a lot of discussions on which codecs to use in WebRTC. And third, they were talking about actually uh, the setting up the call in a secure way, and then they already were listing a lot of technologies in order to set up the call. And one of the purposes of today is that you also understand what are those building blocks, and what do they actually inherit for security risks or what are the security characteristics that can actually offer to the technology. So what I will do, I first give an introduction to WebRTC. I also have some slides on the JavaScript APIs you can use to actually use the technology. But since you're not so familiar with WebRTC, I'll probably skip that and directly go to the deployments. Within the deployments, I will show you in how many different ways you can actually use the WebRTC technology. And I also will show you how that impacts the security as well. And then I have an overview of possible attack factors. How could this uh, new technology be affected by attackers, but also what can this technology actually bring as a security risk to your current applications? So, but first an introduction to WebRTC, and this is a graphical one. So we are talking about technology specified by ITF 
and W3C. And if I have to, to, to split up, this is a very coarse grain split up, I would say, W3C is actually responsible for, for the APIs in the browser, so the JavaScript APIs. IETF is actually responsible to get the whole uh, secure connection between the browser uh, setting up in a secure way and all the, te the technology involved to penetrate firewalls, nuts, and so on. But this is very coarse grained. You should look at the specifications to get a little bit more fine grained uh, split between the two. So, how does it work? Both browsers are actually visiting a website. You're actually visiting a plain website over HTTPS, and we call this part the signaling part. It means that control messages to start up the communication all send over via a regular server. So this is the communication we are all used in web technology. But now it starts. In order to actually set up a connection directly between browser A and B, some uh, entry points, stun and turn, will help to set up that communication. And actually the protocol that they're using there is ICE. And I'll go a little bit more deeper later on in the presentation, but remember those building blocks are actually supporting to set up the call between the two. Based on those information, we can actually securely set up a connection between A and B, and we're using two protocols, DL, DTLS and SRTP. This is the basic setup. Additionally, you can also interact with identity providers. So people that already visited the web uh, uh, session before on identity providers on or out, we already have a clue. So if you, for instance, say we have accounts with Facebook, OpenID, or Google, this is actually a way to identify yourself and to identify yourself to the other side. And we can actually interact each with our own IDP, but we can also interact with the other IDP to verify whether that assertion of the user was actually correct. And this is actually the full picture of the WebRTC technology. So the first thing was the signaling part between the two browsers via a web server. It actually is responsible to load all the JavaScript code in a browser environment to being able to set up a calls in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. And it mediates the control messages and the metadata before the secret connection has been set up. And what's important, there's a lot of specification being done on WebRTC, but the signaling part is open, it's flexible. So every application has to decide for themselves what kind of protocol they will use to communicate between the browsers over the signaling server. So that you can actually use existing protocols, you can interact as a, a gateway to, for instance, XSMP or, for instance, to SIP, but it's open to the, the website deployer what technology or what protocol he actually will use. The media path on the, on the other side is actually the connection peer-to-peer -peer between the two endpoints, between the browsers, and it will not go via the web server. And you can actually set video streams, all the streams on this connection, as you saw in the previous video, but also you can use this channel to exchange data. For instance, you could exchange messages to, for instance, have a chat on, on top of your application, but you could also do that to actually have file transfers between the two peers. What technology are we using for that? Uh, we're actually using a datagram, so we are using the UDP port to send datagram packages, but we're using a datagram TLS, so actually we actually achieve the same features as a TLS uh, connection over TCP. And for the streams, we're using the real-time protocol, but a secure version of the real-time protocol, which allows us encryption, message authentication, and integrity between the two endpoints. But this is the simple case, so we have a media path, we have a signaling path. The question is, do, how do we set it up? And this is actually a little bit complicated. And the good uh, message of, of today is actually a lot of those features are completely hidden for the end user, but also for the website setting up such a connection. Because all these components will be used by your browser in an automatic fashion in order to set up the connection between browser A and browser B. And I will discuss a few of them in a little bit more detail so that you at least have a glimpse of what the technology will do. Because in the security assessment, you will see that they might play a role in actually securing or insecuring your connection. So the first thing is the session description protocol. It's actually a way to send around the initialization parameters between the two browsers. So if two browsers want to communicate, they have to exchange a lot of information. Where could you find them? Which IP addresses? Which are the codecs that are supported? Uh, what type of, of streams do you want to set up between? What's the resolution? And so on. And all that information will be exchanged by SDP in order to make sure that the two browsers are compatible before setting up a browser connection. SDP is not new. It's not a WebRTC artifact. It's actually something already being used in SIP as well to set up between SIP endpoints a connection for audio or for video. And the idea is actually you will be using the signaling server, the signaling part, to send out offers from one browser to the other browser 
and the browser will, on the same path, send an answer back until you say, well, now we have actually a good exchange of parameters to be able to set up the connection between the two. This does not involve yet the way you will actually reroute. It's actually just making sure that you have a good way what endpoints will understand so that they are compatible to each other to put up streams. And this is how it looks like. So I don't want you to, to read out any of the slide, but I just want to give you a glimpse. It's becoming quite, uh, difficult, uh, quite elaborate, the, the protocol itself. It's actually being just reused from a SIP, but the main disadvantage is you typically might have services that want to change the SDP uh, information that is exchanged. It means that J uh, JavaScript APIs will have to parse and uh, interact with this kind of data. And there will be libraries that will help you for that, but this is already quite complex task if you had to change one or two parameters in this SDP. The question then is how you actually connect from browser A to browser B. Because you want to connect, and a lot of people will actually be served after not like we hear at the, the faculty club. There might be firewalls in the way. How do you actually make a peer-to-peer -peer connection? And the techniques that are used to actually make that connection are UDP hole punching. The idea is a browser will actually make a connection to the outside. For that, the net of the firewall will actually allocate an outgoing uh, IP and port for that one connection. You connect to a public server, and the connection is set up between the two. But at that moment, you can actually know which is the outgoing connection for the stream. You do the same at the other side, and you're actually trying to combine the two holes in the, in the firewall to connect back from client to client. This is the basic idea of UDP hole punching. So, so at the, actually, you, you're using a port uh, that you decide for your protocol. A specific port, or you, or you can actually, for instance, an SDP could agree on, on sort port ranges. But you actually, the way you go out, you're going to an other port, uh, you're going to an other IP, but your outgoing port is automatically allocated by your NAT. So even if you have port 20,000 here, it could be that your NAT or firewall is allocating port 30,000 and you're outgoing. And the idea is, once you know you're outgoing on this side and on this side, you just have to make sure that on the same connection you're actually sending data to the browser which is a kind of complicated trick, but you have instruments in the browser to help you to do that. And I will just go one step further in explaining how this works. And public server, what kind of server is it? Well, this is actually the next step. Okay. For the public server, because we want to use this kind of technology, we're using STUN. STUN is the session traversal utility for NAT. This is already something used, for instance, in SIP. The idea is that you actually can use a server outside your own network, the STUN server, the public STUN server, to actually determine what your external IP address and port will be. So the idea is your browser is connecting to the STUN, and the STUN will actually, as part of the messages replying, say, this is your external IP address, this is your external port. So you're getting actually information about the fingerprint uh, towards the outside world on, on uh, your connection. And you're using that information of the STUN to actually doing the UDP hole punching. UDP hole punching is something that is used for other protocols as well, but you're using in WebRTC a STUN server to determine what is the information. Next step. There are quite some situations where piercing one nut is feasible, when you have to pierce two nuts and they have a separate uh, or more fine-grained connection uh, tracking on a nut. The idea of actually Punching through the two nuts is not feasible. So you can do it for one public server, you could do it for the other public server, but you can't do it peer-to-peer -peer if both are behind the nut. In some situations, the nuts are actually set up in that way. So the idea is then, instead of actually using a stun to know the information, you're actually relying on a turn server that will actually allocate a port for you instead of on your nut. Uh, you allocate a port on the turn server, you get an allocation back on the browser, and from that moment on, the browser will interact with the turn server. The turn server will be actually a gateway to, message, uh, to pass all the messages to the browser. So you're really relaying all your data. Instead of going peer-to-peer, -peer, you're relaying your data over turn. And if you're asking which public stun are we using, you will see in most of the examples that people are using now, they're using the stun and turn service from Google. But you could easily set up your own stun and turn server for the services you're delivering to your customers. Also, code have been released already. There are several implementations to actually have a stun or turn set up for your organization. So now we have the basic technologies. We know what the IP address is, we can relay, but of course this is only useful if you can actually set it up in WebRTC. And that's what we're using ICE for, because this is actually an interactive connectivity establishment. 
what will it do? It will actually try several paths between the browser A and browser B until we find one of the connection paths that fits so that the connection can be set up. So typically, you will start by trying to use a stun to know what are the external IP addresses of our network endpoints and then trying to set it up directly peer to peer. You will exchange some candidates of feasible connections being set up. You try them out pair by pair and until you find one and if you find one, then the ICE interaction stops between the endpoints. So ICE is actually really negotiating you could try out this one, you could try out this one. So also, for instance, if you have turn, it could be that you have multiple turn endpoints and you're actually exchanging multiple possibilities for the other side to connect to you. And this is what ICE will do. So I am surely not want to make everyone a network expert. I'm a network expert myself here either, but I just want to give you the basic flavors. How do we set up the peer-to-peer -peer connection? And it's actually we are relying on external stun servers, turn servers to do so. How do we actually make sure that if, for instance, we have a stun server or turn server, that we, this is not a service that is actually accessible by everyone? Typically, there's a symmetric secret used for stun and turn. So you get the secret when you're actually paying for a turn server to, to relay your data, and you're using that symmetric secret between your browser and the turn server to ex be exchanged as part of the protocol. Good. Any questions till now? No? Okay. My guess is that it will keep the same path, uh, same path until actually the path breaks. Uh, the moment we don't get uh, control connections back or uh, we don't get uh, uh, input back, we could use again the signaling path to send out, for instance, a new SDP or a new uh, ICE message. So I think they only will send out ca new candidates on ICE if something is broken with the previous path. For instance, if a firewall is breaking down the connection for some reason, I think they will try to renegotiate. But you, you should have to look it up because I'm not, not sure in this answer. But I think this is the way I saw it. So the, the, the experiments I did, I never saw ICE candidates coming by once the connection has been set up. So next step, and this is a little bit more security related. Um, the way we actually want to interact with IDPs is only limitedly, uh, in, in a limited form uh, specified. The idea is we're actually loading code of the IDP in an iframe and we will use web messaging, also known as post message, to send uh, requests to that iframe and get information back. So the way the IDP is actually processing the signing in or the verification, it's up to the IDP. We just have a very simple interface we're sending messages to the iframe with a very specific notation. This is where I want to sign in with this user. And then the IDP can actually challenge the end user in the browser to authenticate, uh, to use multi-factor or whatever. So it's up to the IDP to interact with the user. The interaction between the browser and the iframe itself, the JavaScript code and the iframe is very limited. I think you have only like two messages and two possible answers as well. So the idea is the browser loads an IDP in an iframe, it gets an identity assertion back from the identity provider after signing in, and you're actually sending that identity assertion to your browser, or you're using that in actually verifying the connection, the browser will verify that identity assertion to know I'm really talking to A or B. So I think this is already an important uh, side remark on WebRTC. So WebRTC does not have a global uh, directory. So with SIP, you have a, like a directory based on the domain names. Um, you could say telephone numbers have also a directory interface. With um, WebRTC, you actually don't need an identity to communicate. You can actually set up just if two peers agree on setting up a connection, you set up a connection. But if you want some identity, you can fall back on existing identity providers already in the internet, like OpenID, uh, like uh, Google ID, like Facebook uh, Connect in order to make sure that you know which is the endpoint you, you want to talk to. But this is very open. You could do it in every way you want. So one of the scenarios that we, for instance, will see, you could deploy this as part of your website, where you say, I don't need to know the identity of the user, but I, I'm offering a help desk. So every user on my browser, on my website, can actually push the button and will call to my help desk over the internet. This is, for instance, a scenario where you might or might not need any uh, identity provision on the client or the server side. Also, the identity provision, 
is not coupled necessarily with the signaling server. And we'll see that that are the variations in WebRTC which make it hard to actually verify or assess the security. So, and the idea is after your assertion gets verified, you actually have an authenticated connection between the endpoints. You know that you're really talking to A and B. Okay, so this is just the basic WebRTC architecture. Any questions on this? In the next four or five slides, I will just give you a flavor of how the APIs look like. We're not going in detail. I don't think it makes sense to already say how you have to develop your application, but I think it's good to just know what are actually the APIs you have to use in your application to communicate. To give you just a flavor of how complex the protocol is, this is actually the complexity of the protocol just to set up your connection. So these are all the messages going around between different components in the browser, between network points uh, over the network. No, no, so the idea is that you have any browser you want. So for now, Chrome and Firefox have a quite good uh, port of implementation, but it, it, the intention within one, two years is if you have Internet Explorer, Safari, Opera, everyone could actually take part in that WebRTC communication. So the specification itself is actually really implementation independent. <laughs> the only thing that is currently um, causing some problems in interoperability is the web codex you have because there have been some discussions on the web codex to be used and every vendor has some different IDs. The idea is mainly even that with WebRTC, you don't need two browsers. And I will show that in the architecture view later on, the deployment. We could also say, well, I'm having a browser communicating to a SIP gateway, for instance. Also, this is something that is supported by the technology, but what the technology provides you, you have um, API calls in JavaScript that offer you the possibility to set up a whole channel and you don't care about the endpoint because the endpoint just have to uh, ratify some of the specifications. I, all the specifications, of course, but it's a very limited set you, you need to interact. No, not only for browsers. But the main use case I expect to see is you have either different browsers to interact or you have some kind of uh, uh, multimedia uh, central point where everything comes together or you have like a gateway to an existing SIP or Jingle or any other infrastructure to communicate to. Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly, you could do that. So I didn't mention it. So there are already some services that are already providing nice WebRTC examples. So um, talkie.io is one of the examples. Um, I will just write it down here. So this is actually a nice way to already see how the technology is working. What does it provide? It already provides you a way of actually saying, well, I just go to the website, I create a unique identifier, and everyone I share the unique identifier with, I can already set up a WebRTC connection. So you don't need identity provision, and it's already a peer-to-peer -peer connection between the two endpoints. Uh, I'm not endorsing Talkie.io, but if you just want to know what is WebRTC technology looking like, without having to implement or set up anything, you could already have a good example showcase there. There are also other um, examples where you actually could share files, where you say, well, I want to securely share a file with you, I give you an identifier by mail, and we're just using WebRTC peer-to-peer -peer connection to actually share the file. There are all limitations on the data channel who large it can be, but you can actually split up the, the chunks that you're sending over between the two peers. And so also already the services in that direction are, are popping up, because already dragging your file into the browser is already allowed with the new HTML5. You now have a peer-to-peer -peer connection, and you could save the end result in, in, on your local file system. So things are popping up. It's not only for communication. But the idea that you have a peer-to-peer -peer possibility really opens a whole new world of possible applications. Also, what, what I not, didn't tell yet, so now we are actually using the camera and the microphone. With extension in the browser, it's also possible to actually share your, your desktop. This is something that is already available in a lot of commercial um, teleconferencing tools, but also that is an opportunity, but this is not directly accessible by the APIs. You need an extension because there is actually a kind of privacy leak if you just by, by default could share your whole desktop or your whole screen to the other endpoint. So you really have to be conscious by installing the extension to do that. Okay, we don't go into detail in the whole graph, just a little flavor of how does it look like. Well, getting user media in the browser is as simple as actually using the, uh, the, the method get user media. You say whether you need audio or video, you could have multiple options of what you actually will want to have about your streams and automatically you get a stream that you can use in your application. You can use it locally 
to put it on the canvas, to put it on uh, a video element, but you could also add it to a peer connection, which is actually resembling the connection to the other peer, and automatically the stream will be shared with the other peer. So quite basic APIs to allow that streams all coupled to a peer connection. Whenever you are actually calling get user media, as you saw in the video, then you will get a pop-up to ask if you want to actually give, uh, allow your uh, video or microphone to be shared with the other side. What is the status of this already? Is it already available? This is already available in Chrome and Firefox, yes. Okay, and it's working. It's working. But you still could suffer from some of the connections, so if there's no stun server configured for you, so you could still say it's not on every network yet available if you don't configure it right. But the technology is already available, so if I would have brought two laptops, we could already interact with each other. We, we can even try it out in the break to see if it just works on the browser you have sitting there on your laptop. And, and I see Talkie.io is actually one of the websites I, I captured here in, the, uh, in, the, in the, the slide, so you don't need to write it down, you, you see it there. So, next thing. So we have uh, a stream, we can couple it to a peer connection, but of course we first need a peer connection. So this is actually the second slide, setting up the peer connection. You have some configuration, for instance, here, I give you some parameters to, which, to use which stun to actually being able to interact with. You actually create a new RTC peer connection, and from then on, you could actually add streams as well. And here you could see, even if the remote side is actually adding a stream, so we have an event handler. If a stream has been added to your P connection, you could capture the stream and say, display it locally here in my screen, in my video element. So this is actually very basic. With those two slides, we already can set up a P connection and having both sides sending a stream, receiving a stream. It's almost as simple as that because all the underlying technology will do the rest for you. So handling SDP offers and answers. The SDP uh, the, the, the peer connection needs to be set up, needs to exchange some information. So you need a way to actually get all the information from your browser over the signaling path. And I mentioned already before, this is something that you have to code customly. You have to actually make custom for your application or choose custom for your application a signaling me method. Here I was just using a very simple way of actually sending around JSON from one browser to the other browser via the server. So the moment you actually get SDP information offers and answers, you're using that channel to send all to receive, and if you receive, you're actually coupling that information back to your browser. The statements here, you can read them as actually being sequential, but these are just success handlers callbacks in JavaScript. I don't want to spend too much time. Once you set up a communication, you could use those slides to, to see what are the different steps I need to be able to set up the communication. With the five slides I'm showing here, you should actually be able to share already between two um, browsers a video stream uh, from one end to the other end. So the, the purple here is application specific. This is what I meant with you really have to make it custom for your application. There's no standard defined in how to do that. But it's not that complicated either. Here you see just having that info in JSON and being uh, making stringify and then making it object together is already sufficient to exchange the information. Okay, same with ICE candidates. You're actually making sure that whenever you have ICE candidates, you're sending them around to the other side you receive them and you add them locally to your peer stream to say, well, I received an IC candidate. And from that on moment on, you're exchanging IC candidates until the connection gets set up. But again, with the whole, how the, the browser will actually deal with processing the IC candidates and setting up the connection, this is fully abstracted from the JavaScript APIs. The browser does that for you. Last thing, setting up a data channel. Well, you give it a name, you may give it some options, and then you actually have a data channel, and this data channel you can use to actually send and receive, and you can also close the data channel. Nothing spectacularly, but this is the way where you actually can create multiple streams, multiple data channels. I didn't mention that before, so it's not only one video stream, you could have multiple streams, even multiple streams from different sites could be combined in one browser. So you can send it a chat. Yeah, indeed. And for instance, for, for uh, uh, Google Chat now, you typically need to have your browser already supporting more than what is already in specification, or you need an extension. Within the near future, this is something that is fully capable of being done by WebRTC. And I mentioned here for the identity provider, you actually set which domain which is responsible for identity provision, and then automatically the, the right iframe will be loaded from that identity provider. 
Here's some code that you could actually manually get the assertion, but it is something that happens behind the scenes to actually make a fingerprint for your endpoint. Again. The identity provision, I think it's not yet active. I think they're still developing on that. Well, all the other parts, they are fully active in the browser. So I must be honest, I didn't try out the identity provider because I didn't find good examples of identity providers yet. So probably there are some identity provider examples out. But I, as I will mention, this is still something that I think needs some further thoughts in actually operating how identity management is done in WebRTC. OK, I think by now we know the building blocks. I will do a little quiz later on about Stun and Turner. <laughs> You know a little bit the APIs. You don't have to, to remember them by heart. You just to give the flavor how you interact. And you will see it's actually a very small layer of JavaScript APIs you need in order to set up the whole communication. What I want to, to spend some time on now is actually how do I see the use of WebRTC? And this is something I didn't find in documents. This is actually something I grabbed together by actually having a lot of interactions on WebRTC with colleagues, with partners, and by reading some blogs and, and websites as well and seeing some other presentations. Um, what I see is actually, I will do it three times, that I see four variations in the way you're using WebRTC. And the first thing is, well, as I already mentioned, I could imagine that you have a singling server and a browser, and that the, the server itself will also act as the endpoint. You actually will use the technology uh, in order to actually make sure that you have a connection to the person that is actually running the website. So it could be two different servers, but at least what I mentioned here, it's owned by the same entity. And as a browser, you're just making connections to the signaling server. So you actually have a two-party setup. The signaling server is the endpoint as well, and you have your browser contacting that person. And this is something you already see with e-commerce sites now nowadays. You could already have a kind of chat interface to ask certain questions about products on the website. Well, the next, next step will be that you can just call that website to answer in real time with video and audio. And this is something quite easy to set up with the new technology. A second one, and I think this is the basic example, is a two-party video conference. You actually have two browsers, you have a signaling server, and you're actually interacting with two entities. <coughs> but this doesn't limit the way you are using the signaling path. There are all cases possible where you say, well, there's not a single signaling server. You actually have multiple signaling servers. So it could be that, you, for instance, I connect to Google, someone else is connecting to Facebook, and we're actually making a, a channel through Google and Facebook in a federated setup we're actually we, uh, using and exchanging information between the two different signaling servers. I'm running in the domain of Google. That one is running in the domain of Facebook, for instance. And this is something that is perfectly possible because the signaling part is not specified how you have to do it. And the third one, ah, the fourth one, which I already mentioned before as well, is by using the same technology, similar like the help desk, but you're interacting with existing voice over IP or video uh, teleconferencing infrastructure. So you could actually connect to a gateway of SIP, of XMMP, Jingle, whatsoever. And this is all four different ways, but the way they actually influence security, that might have a large impact. The fact, for instance, that you say, well, here, depending on you trusting the signaling server to set up connection, you already have some trust in actually, they can already execute JavaScript APIs. So it's kind of normal that you trust them to be the endpoint of the connection as well. So they may know who you're connecting to because that it's themselves. In this setup, it's much more complicated because here you say, well, actually, I'm running JavaScript code under domain or origin A. Here it's running under origin B. And if something goes wrong, actually origin A can directly influence origin B, which is a case we typically didn't had in the web before. And also this case, because you're actually connecting to a legacy gateway, it also means that you can now they see attacks interacting with the gateway, with the legacy infrastructure in ways that were not uh, predicted before. Because now all of a sudden, web messages get translated to the, real infra uh, to the old infrastructure and, and vice versa. So for security point of view, every variation that I will show you today might have a different impact in how you do the security assessment of the technology. So this is one variation point, deployments. I think this is clear? Okay, next. How do we actually interact with, with the other parties? So until now, we had like one party calling the help desk. We always had a kind of two-party two setup, which is the peer-to-peer -peer connection we actually intended to have in the first slide. But nothing actually keeps us actually from doing a mesh network. So we could say, well, we are with four people in a, in a telco, 
And instead of actually having one central point of, uh, of sending it all via one other person, every other browser could connect directly to the other. So you could really have a mesh, a peer-to-peer -peer network where everyone is exchanging with everyone else. This, for instance, could be a file sharing service where actually everyone peer-to-peer -peer is sharing all in the same platform. You could also have it in a star network where you say one of the browsers is actually responsible of relaying some data to, to each other. It means that every browser is connecting to that single browser and that one is actually the peer that's handling over streams from one to the other, which is, for instance, composing different streams together and then sending it out to all three browsers. This could be one of the cases. And at that moment, this browser is actually responsible of handling all the incoming streams and also creating the outgoing stream. There's also a possibility. It means that this one will have higher bandwidth than the others. Here you're actually sharing the bandwidth over the different nodes, but you have to resend certain information over and over. And then the, the case where we also expect that uh, will happen quite often is where you have a multi-point control unit where you actually have all the media being connected to that central point and that one will be the one that distributes, that, dip, uh, that actually decides which stream is going in which direction. And with this you could actually think about the classical setups where you have telco conferences, where you typically already have hardware that is doing this kind of switching between the different parties, which is deciding which new connections get set up and how they get rerouted. But all those also have an impact on how you have to set up it in your application. Also means it depends on what setup you need, who is actually being uh, responsible for your streams, is responsible for actually uh, running your JavaScript code. To give an example, for instance, in this setup, it means that this browser will actually be able to handle the streams from all the others. Whereas in this scenario, you could say I'm sharing different information between two browsers that the others not, are not allowed to be seen. Also here, you have an MCU, so suddenly, all of a sudden, the four browsers have to trust an external entity to actually reroute and also to handle their streams in order to do the communication between the different peers. So depending on your trust model, you might want to have one or the other in the setup you're doing, but not only trust, perhaps also performance and other characteristics might decide which is the setup that is actually most suited to your application. Of course, if you say we have a two-party setup, it's much more simple, but the technology itself is not limited to a two-party. If you were uh, mentioning Google Hangout, for instance, this is already a setup where you have different variations in how you would share the information with Google Hangout. So you could imagine that you don't need any core infrastructure, even if we are on disconnected local LAN, all of a sudden we can actually have a video conference in the style of Google Hangout. This is possible with the new technology. Okay. Let me have a quick break. So we now saw how you actually make your network topology and how you actually have the architecture of interacting with signaling server and with the endpoint. The last one is a little bit more security related, is the way you're actually deploying IDPs. As I mentioned before, you could actually use IDPs to have identity assertions and to verify them, but again, uh, there might be certain variations in who is actually owning the IDP. So a first case where actually the calls represent um, the, the trust domains, you could say the signaling server is responsible for the IDPs. This is the scenario where you would say Google is offering WebRTC for their Hangout services. Actually, they are the IDP where browsers will interact with. That's the identity that you also will see of the other part you're connecting to. This is a possible setup. And then you're actually using the IDPs to make sure that your peer-to-peer -peer connection is really end-to-end -end authenticated. But you're trusting the signaling server to actually handle all the information about identities. In a second setup, you could say, well, it's not the signaling server that is deciding what IDP to use. It's actually the user that chooses his own IDP. You could imagine that the browser has a pre-configuration of which are your identities you want to use. And actually, whenever you're interacting in a WebRTC call, you could select one of the identities that matches your identity at that moment for that specific call. And one of the technologies that is really close to that is the way Mozilla is currently pushing Persona as an identity provisioning system. So in the browser itself, you could actually say the user is choosing one of those identities to be pushed forward. But in this case, what I'm describing here, it's the user still that is deciding what identity provider I want to use, which identity I actually need in this call. If you're using Persona one step further, you could actually say, well, the identity in the Firefox browser is by default Persona. In a Chrome browser, it's automatically your, your Google identity. 
And in that moment, it's not the user anymore, it's not a signaling server. You could actually say, whenever you set up something between browsers, the browsers could make an implementation that they, by default, already identify or make an identity based on your standard identity in your browser. Because it's not specified how this has to happen, it's only specified how you interact with the identity provider, but it doesn't mention who is actually responsible of putting the identity provider in your browser. And third, you could even, uh, fourth, you could even say, well, the first scenario where the signaling server is choosing, in a federated setup where you have multiple signaling servers, you could actually say, well, each signaling server might choose his own IDP as well. But that's, again, a little bit this situation, but rather than having a single setup, you have a federated setup where each browser is running in a different domain with a different identity provider. And there are many more combinations possible, but just to give you a glimpse, um, identity provision at this moment is so open-ended that we don't know what will happen with identity provision. My guess is that um, the browser will probably be very, uh, become a central point of actually choosing your identity provider, or at least will give you the possibility to choose your identity provider in your browser. On the negative side, since it's at this moment very open, you don't have to choose an identity provider for your connection. And also the way the identity provider actually is displayed if the verification succeeds is not standardized. So every browser could do his own way of displaying what identity is actually being verified. And I think until now, the browsers don't have an implementation on that part to even show you that identity is verified. And I think this is one of the things that on impact I really want to, to stress. Identity, I think it's very important, but at this moment it's not clear in which direction it will go. Good. And with that basic information, I think we can already start to discuss some of the attack factors within WebRTC. So, um, within my overview of attacks, I actually want to mention some of the classical web attacks and show you how they actually can have an impact on WebRTC as well. I want to spend some time on the WebRTC permission model. I will show you some confidentiality leaks within WebRTC setups. I will refocus a little bit more on the topic I already mentioned on identity, on how we can actually uh, have the identity of the endpoint being uh, jeopardized. And also I will show you a few examples of how you could attack the underlying infrastructure. I will not go in very much detail, so I, I would typically make diagrams on how the attack works, but we can discuss, and if you have questions on any of the attacks, we can spend a little bit more time. I have planned some time in the presentation to have that discussion, that interaction. So the first thing is the classical web attacks, you don't have to forget them. So if you remember the talks of Jim on, on XSS, on uh, injection attacks, on all the other things, well, I think they're still the case, and they might even be more important to not forget within a WebRTC uh, setup. So if you're looking to the client side, for instance, this is the way your whole infrastructure is working. The only thing I added now, because it's another stakeholder that's involved within your application, is a third-party JavaScript. As mentioned already by Philip, this is also a way of actually jeopardizing your client side. Also in WebRTC, I expect that some of the things that now were coded in the previous slides uh, manually, there will be several libraries available in JavaScript of the framework you're using that will already provide all the technology, uh, will hide the further interaction with the WebRTC APIs. You just have to set up a WebRTC and they will do all the, the interaction. They might even be responsible for the signaling. So I, I think in WebRTC scenarios in the near future, you will see a lot of third party libraries be popping up that will do all the complexity for you. You only need to embed one library and you have a WebRTC enabled website. So the first attack. One thing that we didn't have before in the classical web was that a browser could directly attack another browser. This is something we were always interacting with the web server. We had attacks where someone else was trying to, to trick us in visiting another link or visiting some information from the web server that was, uh, for instance, injected with cross-site scripting. But we ne never had a case where a browser can send data directly to another browser without the server noticing or even know that something has been sent. And I think this is an important case. Certainly, depending on the, the deployment where you're running on, it could be that the website code setting up the connection in browser A runs in origin A, but that the browser B runs in origin B, for instance, in the federated setup. And then all of a sudden, it's not only that you can actually infect another browser, you could even infect another browser on another origin than you're working on. 
And how could you infect? Well, think about, for instance, cross-site scripting. If you say we have a data channel between browser A and B, if you're sending data over to B and that gets rendered into B, if the validation step in B is lacking or is not done in a, in a correct way, it could actually be that you're actually getting XSS in browser B from your origin A. And this is really a scenario that you have to think of. Because we didn't have that before, we always were counting on that you had an interaction with the web server that had some control over the endpoint. It's actually a little bit worse. We can also have the signaling server contacting our browser. Of course, we already had in the past that your web server could push arbitrary JavaScript or arbitrary data that has malicious effects. But now it can actually also use the connection between browser A and browser B to infect another browser. And this is really bad because now we're actually losing the whole traceability. We're getting attacked by this server, but rather than we can see it coming in over the channel over HTTPS, now they're actually relaying via the other browser to attack browser B. And especially in the case where we have a federated setup, you could have one web server attacking the client of another web server. And this is something that we didn't have before in the web. That interaction between browser A and B is really important. And third, something that is also important to remember is we already saw in previous talks that third-party JavaScript that wants to behave malicious could have a lot of harm in your browser A, but now all of a sudden it could also attack the other browser. So you really can either directly use this channel to do something evil on the other endpoint, but you could also try to relay your attacks via the browser so that it's really hard to trace where it comes from. But nothing new. I think you're already prepared to see all the classical web attacks. You only have to think about this new attack surface coming in between the two browsers. And this is something that vendors and also the technology is not yet prepared for. So really the data channel is something that we really have to be very careful in processing data from the data channel. And we will have to educate our, our um, developers to really take that as an input source as well. Okay, this is already what I mentioned. Um, I think what is also important, it's not only the client side, also the server side could be attacked. So you could, of course, via a browser, trying to attack a signaling server, but you could actually use the browser to browser connection to attack your other signaling server, which is a case we didn't have before. We typically say, well, if you see something coming in, we know that this browser would be responsible for the attack. And now, all of a sudden, a browser you don't have any connection with could actually send something via another browser to attack your web server. You could, of course, already have in the past that you have attacks that you send something via mail to another person. He's clicking the mail and he's attacking his web server. But now, all of a sudden, it's real time. You're actually sending it directly to the other browser and to the web server. There's no processing, no user interaction required for that. Also, the signaling part, you have to take into account that we have a federated setup. There might be some trust in exchanging data, but also there, a classical web firewall will not help. The classical web patterns will, might not help in actually detecting what's going on here because it's not anymore a, a browser that is sending data. The way you process data coming in from the other signaling server, it's really machine-to-machine -machine communication. It shouldn't be a hard case. You probably have already in your organization a lot of machine-to-machine -machine communication even over HTTPS or between web servers, but you have to take into account it might open new attack service to your standard application. And third, which is, might be the worst, is you actually you want to attack from this signaling server the other signaling server, but you're using actually the connection via the browsers to attack the other signaling server. And this is something which is really, really hard to trace what's going on. You see attacks coming in, but who is to blame? And this is something I expect you might be already aware of the attacks coming in, but you might lose a lot of the traceability you had before in the web where you could say, well, I'm pinpointing this responsible or this responsible. It reminds me a little bit of a cross-site request forgery where we had diffuse deputy. Also there, we were a little bit confused who was actually triggering the request. I think here it's a little bit worse because we can really do a lot of more nasty scenarios and actually getting peace connecting, peace doing stuff on our behalf. But this is something to remember. It's nothing new, it's just because we have a new path, the classical attacks might come in via other means. Is that clear to everyone? The WebRTC permission model. 
So this is one of the things I, I really think we should spend some time on. Um, and maybe we should do it like a little quiz. So we can do either the quiz, you have to guess what is the permission model, but I, I will do the quiz a little bit, I will give it a little twist today. So what would you as an end user would like to have? And you have to just to answer if you want to be involved in giving consent, yes or no. Of course, this is a little bit arbitrary because we are having technical people here, but it will give you a better flavor of what is actually existing and what you would like to have as an end user. I'm not an UI expert, so it has implications on consent and UI, but I just want to give you the flavor of what is currently the model. So, for which operation you would like to be involved in actually giving the consent? Someone wants to see data from your camera. You want to be involved, luckily you are involved. You saw already the permissions popping up, you need to give permission that website is actually requiring access to your camera. Microphone, yes, of course. Um, getting network characteristics, knowing your IP address of your NAT, your ports, all the information about your local network, so also the private network and so on. What? Yeah, but do you want to say I, the browser can do it automatically, or do I need to give permission to do that? So actually, you don't have to give permission, and this is actually one of the tags recently been get, getting some publicity. You could easily do a fingerprint of a user because now all of a sudden all the networks you have from here to the firewall will quite uniquely identify you on this moment. Your local IP address, your, your gateway, uh, the next IP address, your NAT, your public IP address and so on. And this is something you don't have to give any permission. Automatically you, you say give me IC information, you get the information. Setting up a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Unfortunately, it will do it automatically. So you will not see that the connection is being set up. The only thing it will ask you here is if you put a stream from your camera or your microphone on top of it, it will ask permission for to do that. If it's purely data data, you don't have to give permission at this moment. <laughs> this is strange, yes. But this is the reason why I'm giving this topic, right? <laughs> um, sending your audio video to remote peer. So, it, so you're connected, you're seeing your own local video in your browser. Do you want to be involved in the consent of actually sending that information to another peer? No, once you give permission to actually get your audio video access. Yeah, but you can, which one? Which video? Which, which video? The camera. The camera. The camera. Okay. No, no, no. Not the file. No, I did. That's a good point. This video. So if you have multiple videos, I... I because you have multiple channels, you have multiple... Uh, I mean, it could be a little more than that. Yeah. Um, so for so for file access, the the HTML firewall is not allowed to read out data outside a restricted area of your hard disk. So it actually makes it a virtual file system. So reading out a movie or any other file in your file system, it will not be able. If you're showing a video in your browser, you're for instance watching any XXX video on your website or on a website. Actually, it's quite easy to send that video to another remote parties without you being involved. Um, also, you getting a connection. Okay, getting connection from you, I could send that video to someone else without any consent. So this is what I wanted to say. Once you gave permission for that application to read out data from your camera or microphone, pushing a stream to an other endpoint, you're not involved. Sharing your screen. Okay. So this is good and bad. Good is. You need to explicitly install an extension because the APIs to see the rest of your screen is only accessible by extensions. The bad thing is, it might not necessarily ask you for permission again on a website basis. Once the extension, if you give the extension permission to load on every website, it can actually for every website share your data, uh, share, share your screen. When you say share your screen, the full screen? The full screen. The browser itself, the browser itself does not have the ability in his JavaScript APIs, but the extension APIs are more privileged, and they have actually bit by bit control to see the whole screen. Yeah. What? Yeah. 
I think at this moment it is so. I think it's the moment at this moment, but it's an implementation because this is something that is not part of the specifications. So you could easily say in this version of Chrome or the next version of Chrome, um, actually the API to call from an extension to share to, to see your desktop could be limited. It's, it's not only a browser extension, it's more of a software that you install on your laptop. No, no, it's, it's, the, just it's just an extension. You need an extension of two lines of code to do that. But um, I, I'll have to rephrase. It's not in the permission model of WebRTC, but a, a browser could say, I think it's so restricted that I need to interact with the user to do that. Okay, it's, not specified. it's not specified. So in that sense, I have to rephrase. It's not part of the WebRTC specification. You're relying on extension. And the way the extension talks to the browser, it's, an, it's a common API that you can call in the browser to get then the screen. Mm -hmm. That could be under control of some consent. So I, I think this is a, is a fair rephrasement. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go too, too yeah. black-white. I, I think this is, this is a more open case. Yeah. But at least they realize that sharing your screen is sensitive. So it's not part of the basic WebRTC capabilities you have without actually having access to the privileged uh, operations. And another question for the case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I don't remember. So, uh, what I know for the current implementations, they don't ask anything. But it could again be after some reviewing in the final uh, drafts or the final specification that things might change. All the browsers say we are not obliged, but we will do it because we think it's a good idea. Um, selecting the the peer connection, yes. So everything up until, I, I, until here, I think everything is supported. Yeah. Um, selecting an identity provider that is appropriate for your connection at that moment. It's loading an iframe. You don't need any permission. Verifying your endpoint's identity. What I mean is. Do you want to say I only set up a peer-to-peer -peer connection if I assert that this is the endpoint I want to communicate to? Also, that is not the case. Even if you have IDPs involved, at this moment, it's not clear whether you actually give consent or whether something is blocked depending on the identity of the other side. But to recap from this, in most cases where you are deploying right now, and typically you're not deploying with IDPs, you're not deploying so often with screen sharing, the only request for permission you will get is camera and microphone. And over HTTPS, the specifications say that it even, might even be permanent for a domain. Is there a clear sign that you are connected to another browser? No. Or so, or no. so for the camera and the microphone, a small, in Chrome, for instance, a small camera is showing up as part of the URL bar. For the connection, you don't see any trace of that in your browser. So it could already be that you are browsing nowadays to websites that they're setting peer-to-peer -peer connections up without us knowing. Yeah. And this is the case with the ICE fingerprinting, for instance. This is part of setting up a connection. That people are already doing that for fingerprinting without people actually realizing in their browser, because it's already part of the technologies up and running in their browser. Yeah. But of course, in the end, that's in the peer-to-peer -peer connection. OK, that happens without you explicitly consenting it. As far as that, it looks like a huge security leap. But at the moment, the boss can also already post uh, yeah. to a website. Indeed. So and, and, similar, and similarly, you could already say, well, you have, for instance, uh, ways to actually use sockets, sockets.io and so on, web sockets. But the difference here is that you actually are doing the whole UDP punch holding. So you're all actually setting up a connection through the firewalls, through the NAT, to an endpoint. Yeah. Whereas normally, you would expect, if you're sitting at home, nobody actually is able to set up a connection directly to your laptop. Yeah. It's not only one that you are making connection from your client to the server. Yeah. It's possible that another client makes a connection to your client. But I'm not. But it requires an involvement of your process. So yeah. I will then check to open the whole. Indeed. So, but I, I'm not advocating that this is bad. So l let me no, put that in perspective. But it's it's very hard, especially for people that are more technically involved. 
you would expect certain things, certainly at the first moment, to be much more in the control of the end user. Um, also, one of the things is, um, we would like to see a lot of those things being asked to ourselves, but for the regular user, it might be too much or too complicated to actually make an educated guess whether they have to allow it or not allow it. So in that sense, since I'm not a UI expert, I can see some reasons why I don't want to have an overly loaded permission model. Yeah, because but it's the same as uh, Android, can you install an app? Okay, I'm like, do you want to give the app permission to do this, 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 this? Yeah. And you want to use the app, so you say it. yes. That's true. So indeed, with Android, you want to use the app rather than... Um, but I think this is certainly something that we might need to be reconsidered once we have the first applications up and running for WebRTC, where you see a larger community using the, uh, the, the, the technology provided here to see how it's actually being used and for which things you actually want to have a little bit more control. For instance, especially depending on how the identities will be integrated in your browser, it could be if identities are being integrated, automatically having identity authenticated set up will give you some feedback so you already know that there's at least a connection with that endpoint. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think it really depends on the deployment ways that we might re have to refactor or to reiterate over the different permissions. But actually, <laughs> WebRTC is also for some of those streams, might be a very good way of actually, you run a lot of things locally and you just share information with other people directly. So you can imagine, maybe not in the, in the current games, but some of the games were actually using this technology within the browser to do peer-to-peer -peer setups to actually also push some of the bandwidth and performance to the end users rather than the central relay. Okay, um, one thing I didn't mention, of, or didn't mention explicitly, we have a stream being set up of your camera I'm sending it to my colleague here. What I can do as well as, as JavaScript API, I could actually reroute the same stream to other parties as well. Mm -hmm. So I might have the intention that I'm actually interacting with you, but the JavaScript API I'm using or the signaling server might just decide that it's as good to send it to other parties or send it to the NSA or any other agency. So by now, even if you think in the peer-to-peer -peer setting, it's not sure who you're connecting to because you don't know which connections are being set up. All of a sudden, giving permission to read out your camera and, and microphone, you don't know where that will be end up, ending up. Again, also, we could be setting up a communication. If I receive your video, I could relay it to any other party. And I might not even be aware that I'm re relaying your information to other parties, which is also something to think about. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I, I would like also like to, to, to turn it around. So one of the risks with this is, even if you have a benign website, mm -hmm. if you're running of integrating third-party scripts, they could do that on your behalf. And in that sense, one of the things I, I will give you as, as take-home messages, if you're setting up WebRTC in your company, really isolate it very well from the rest of the applications to make sure that you don't have those dependencies of other campaigns that might influence how your traffic gets rerouted of how you're interacting with your end users. Phishing opportunities, very briefly, because it's a little bit open, you are getting actually an iframe and you have to enter your credentials. Because it's an iframe, you don't see the identity of, or the origin of the iframe. It could also be that you're actually having phishing opportunities for websites that are offering peer-to-peer -peer communication. So something to think about. But I imagine in the browsers within one year, two years, the whole IDP concept might be much more integrated into the browser itself, and then I think this problem is, does not longer exist, because then IDPs will really be something the browser that will do for you, rather than you seeing a login screen of Google or anything else. Um, well, with I, you, you just need an iframe. Yeah. So, but the, you don't need an origin for the iframe. So the origin could uh, the iframe could also be, for instance, uh, not the only hard disk because I think interacting between an SSL site and, and your hard disk will not be allowed. Ah, but you could you could, for instance, use SourceDoc. With SourceDoc, you could actually specify which HTML code is running inside your iframe. So there might be ways around of actually not being interacting with an external entity, but actually having something locally. So the fingerprinting, I already explained in much more detail, the screen sharing as well. And the 
authenticity of the channel, so the, the secret channel between the, the two peers, we will focus a little bit more detail what I mean with the security of that. But it really depends on the IDPs. If you don't use the IDPs, it basically gives you no information on who is actually interacting with you. And in that sense, I think it's really, since this is really an open question, who will be responsible for selecting the IDP, will, will be responsible to do the verification, I think, or, or displaying the verification step to the end user, I think it's really a crucial part of WebRTC, which is not completely clear to me at this moment. Yes, you need a signaling server somewhere on the internet. Yeah, so for instance, in, in preparing some of the slides, I wanted to have some small scripts. So that was also the slide that I gave with the, the different JavaScript calls. I just have internally at the university one uh, Node.js server pushing the JavaScript to the clients and we were interacting on the local LAN. So this is perfectly possible even without having actually external communication. So one thing I remember right now, I was talking about the stun. Um, maybe it's also interesting to mention to you that the stun is also something you configure it as a, as a configuration parameter, for instance, in the P connection. But this is not the only case. If you are not able to connect, it might be that your browser is injecting another stun as well. So if you're using Chrome, there's a good chance if you're trying to set up the local communication internally, it doesn't work. At some moment in time, that an external stun or turn might be contacted by Google, from Google because this is also something that is not specified, that you have full control over which stun and turn service will be used because of what you specify on the, on the APIs. It can be a good case because if you say by default, Chrome is also using Google stun service to make sure that, that, that it's facilitating the setup, but it might also have privacy implications. Yeah. And I just want to mention that because before we go into the privacy considerations later on, I just saw that I forgot this. Well, actually we are there, potential leaks. But before we go to the potential leaks, what I explained until now, everything is clear? So you're already a big fan of WebRTC? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's at Actually, I think it's actually a very nice technology. So I, I might be a little bit pessimistic. I think certain things need to be cleared out in the near future. But I think the technology itself is really wonderful what it can bring to the browser. So it's, it, it is still early, but it might be interesting to think already if I want to deploy this within my company within the next two years, three years, what are the things I need to think about in setting up this as part of my architecture? And so I think it's, for that is the right moment to already mention to you, but I don't expect you to go home and say on Monday we will have our own WebRTC development being started. So I think it's a little bit of much of when is the right time frame to step into this technology. Um, yeah. Um, I think Oprah might, Oprah might support it as well, I'm not, not sure. They are also in the committee, so, but I expect actually the, the IE12, what I'm uh, talking about, that, that might have support on all the next version. So I don't think it will come to IE11 or earlier, but I think it might be the new version that they're developing that, that has the, because uh, Microsoft is really involved as well in uh, the specifications. Mm -hmm. So actually all the browser vendors are really uh, collaborating on this. Only the main conflict is which uh, codecs do we need and what do we already have in our patent portfolio for that. I, I think this is the, some of the things that are actually delaying the technology of being launched further on. Are there already some sites with application that you can freely really access? Well, talking.io is something that you can freely access before. Yeah, instance. yeah and, and actually webrtc.org had an a list of examples of websites you can use. Talkie.io. And the other websites, so I, I know that there's, if you search for WebRTC file sharing, you will also find already some sites that are showing this. So there are already websites popping up, the first services on top of WebRTC. Good. Timing-wise, 10 minutes. So I will have to speed up a little bit, but I, I just make, if the speed is too fast, stop me. We can go five minutes over time if necessary as well. Um, confidentiality leaks. So now it's becoming interesting. What can go wrong in actually leaking information? Um, let's first look to the global architecture again, but I focus not on the communication, but on the metadata. Metadata, So also something that agencies might be interested, for instance, in who is talking to who. Although this morning we saw from Bart that not only the metadata, but also the communication might be something under their control, but first the metadata. Of course, it's quite clear that the signaling server has access 
to what's going on in the connection. If he sees the SDPs coming by, he might even see identities coming by on the signaling server, so he knows which uh, entities are communicating to each other. Secondly, if you have stun and turn servers, the turn server of COF is relaying communication between two parties. They know that the two parties are interacting with each other. But also, if you have stun servers that are very global, like the, the stun server of Google, a lot of communication, even internally in your organization being set up, that are contacting a stun server of Google, they might already see and be able to match certain endpoints communicating to each other. This is something that might leak out metadata of who is communicating to who. And of course, third, every JavaScript running in your browser is able to have events being coupled, uh, event listeners to all the events that are WebRTC related, so they actually can see all the metadata as well. So they can actually follow who is talking to who. So again, example of, uh, of I think yesterday morning, the Google Analytics being involved in a lot of websites. I don't think personally it's a good idea of having a lot of third-party JavaScript in the websites you're using with WebRTC because there might information on metadata leak out, even if they're not malicious, but they can monitor to what identities are you interacting with. And fourth, of course, the identity provider, because you see actually an assertion, you see another browser verifying the assertion, you also can link that back to WebRTC, those two parties are interacting with each other. Okay, but what's more important? Who is actually able to eavesdrop? Who is actually to break up that secret channel between browser A and B. The channel, is it end-to-end -end, uh, encrypted? It's end-to-end -end encrypted, yes. Okay. The network provider? <laughs> so the first thing is and setting up a man in the middle. And this is something I will show in uh, the, the next group of things I, I bundled to. But for now, let's assume there might be ways to set up a man in the middle, even on that secret channel. This is one way of actually uh, leaking information. I think one that is even more important is whenever there's JavaScript running in this browser coming from the signaling server of the dead party, since you can actually reroute streams, you can easily have a connection between A and B, but one of the parties or one of the scripts running inside the environment of that party might actually leak the information away. So if you say, I'm having Google Analytics here, and there's an order of, of NSA, and this is all hypothetical, they might actually say, well, whenever this browser is setting up something, you have to reroute the stream to another destination. And since you are not notified that the new connection has been set up in your browser, this is something that you will not notice that is happening within your environment. So I think really the signaling server and the third party, they really have a lot of capabilities of actually pulling this off. So even, and, and that's what we see in the next part, if there's authenticity between browser A and B, and I think this is really a good case that we can create that authenticity of the endpoints, then being able to actually say the same stream is linked to another P connection and is pushed away, I think this is actually a very strange mental model where you say, I have a really secure connection between identities, I'm using identity providers to make sure that that identity really matches, and then with some simple commands, I push this stream away. But it's implicit uh, authentication, it's not explicit. Uh, it's, it's automatic authentication. Yes, but you can use the identity providers to actually get that authentication. Yeah, but to be prompt to offer you a password or something. Yeah. You, you can force this. You can't. Well, your identity provider, yeah. what the browser will do is say, if you say, well, set identity provider, the moment you want to set up a connection, it will actually, from the port, so let me, I will do it differently. I will show you how authenticated channels are set up, and then you ask me the same question again. Is that good? Okay. So endpoint authentication. So back just repeating, we have the green channel between browser A and B, and now we will focus on how we use the identity providers underneath to actually being able to set up the green connection. So what will happen? You want to set up a connection, the first thing you ask is information from the stunned server uh, you get from your browser. There's somewhere a key in there which is actually the key that will be used to actually use this secure communication between browser A and B. What you will do is include that information about your IP address and so on, also information about the fingerprint of that key in your SDP request. And what you do now is actually sending that SDP over the messaging channel and you set up a connection. What happened 
happens if someone can actually modify the SDP here and replace it by something else, he can actually have the fingerprint of the port of a man in the middle. So the connection is coming in into the browser, the browser is setting up with the man in the middle, the man in the middle is setting a new connection to the browser here. Just because the information in the SDP is not protected in any way. And that's where actually the identity providers come into play because without the identity providers, even if everything is encrypted here, as you say, you can just still have a man in the middle because you don't know which is the endpoint. So second chance, we're doing it with IDP. We're getting the same information back, but before we actually create the SDP, we're asking the identity provider to make an assertion based on our identity and also the fingerprint of our port. And the assertion, is it really uh, information about the user or more about the, the, the browser you are using? Yeah, the user. So it's really... The user, so the name of the user yeah. Or it can be an anonymous credential, but something that the identity provider can say, yes, yes I'm sure. What? It's actually, you ask the identity provider, give me an assertion, and this is the metadata that you have to sign with it. Yeah. And then the identity provider can interact with the end user via, via the iframe. Okay. And he can actually decide what he's giving. Okay. So it could be, for instance, that you say, I'm, I'm not liking Google or Facebook or anything else, but I have an IDP which actually creates anonymous identifiers. So the only thing I need to know is this user really a uh, user of identity provider X. That could be the thing that is signed within the, the assertion. So the assertion just says, the information you need to know to verify that I'm allowed to communicate to you, that's something under control of the identity provider. Think about it as like if you have something like OpenID or Out or even Shibboleth, you could say the assertion could only mention that this is a user and if you need more metadata to be able to use it, you interact again, interact directly server to server. So here what the specification says is you interact with the user via the iframe and gives back an assertion. And secondly, you can verify the assertion in the same way, but it doesn't say what has to be in the assertion. But the idea of the assertion here is that actually you're also sending a challenge response about the fingerprint of the browser, so that also the, the browser's fingerprint, or the, actually the keys you will use to interact on the secret channel, are also part of that assertion. So the, it's like the non uh, part of, of, of some data that you're sending to the identity provider to make sure that this is coupled. And from then on, if you're sending this to the other side, if you replace this, you also have to replace the information about identity. Because you can't actually have the same identity provider signing another port or another key. Okay, so you cannot tamper anymore without... The moment you tamper with it, it will be visible in the SDP. Mm -hmm. You could say, I, I remove the assertion. This is one possibility. You could say, I, I, I put in another assertion. But you will not be able to actually push the same SDP along by giving different material of keying material to connect with, with your browser without having an impact on the assertion. And this means once you get here, your signature doesn't match or the information of the pods has been tampered with, your browser will actually not be able to set up the connection if you actually uh, are interacting with identity provider setup in your connection. And this is the reason why I'm saying it's really important that the IDPs are being used even if the IDPs or under control of the signaling server. Because you just want to make sure that no third party somewhere in the chain is able to replace it. You want to make sure that the identities are really checked between the browsers and are coupled on an identity. Back to your question. Uh, your IDP running on your browser. Yeah. Can you ask for authentication from you? Yes, well, that is the, that's the idea. It depends on the IDP. So since you're loading an iframe in your browser, yeah. it could be that Google says, this is really user A because he's already logged in. So you're, you're actually... Because there's already a cookie identifying you. If you're logged in already... Yeah. So, and that's the reason I think why they, they keep it very open. Because every identity provider might have a different ID. For others you might need to insert your smart card. You have multi-factor. But you're using... Yeah. So, but you're using an iframe in the origin of the identity provider, and this is the reason why we had origin previously, because you're actually saying the identity provider needs to decide whether he's allowed to sign or not, because he will not sign if you're not able to show a, a previous session cookie or provide credentials or anything else. Okay? And, and I think this is really important. If you plan to work with WebRTC, don't forget about the identity part. But as I think at this moment, 
there might still be a, uh, some tweaks in how identity will evolve, how it will be integrated in the browsers. It's something to watch for. Yeah. Yeah, but even. So, so, but the iframe itself. Yeah, that's one thing. The other thing I mentioned before, and that might uh, also give you some of the confusion. I think. The iframe is one solution. I think the browser will provide their own way. If you don't provide the iframe, then I might couple already hard code in the browser that you have a default identity provider. And there I think Google will probably push his Chrome account, uh, Google accounts, whereas for instance, Mozilla is working on Persona. But this is just a very subjective own view on how identity can work in the future. But I think it might be that the browser has more at stake than just saying, well, I will load an iframe. But in the specs, this is the way it is specified. You load an iframe, but the ger very generic what will happen at that moment. Good. And actually, I'm quite near to the end. And also, I'm quite near the, the time I have left uh, to talk about. So one thing I mentioned before, the stun and the turn service, they have shared symmetric secret. It's a nice way of actually being able to at least authenticate or actually having multiple tenants using the same stun server. But it's something from the past. It's something that worked very well in SIP. The problem is here now that shared secret is just some plain text in your browser. So if I connect once with Google Hangouts and I have the, the, the shared secret that you have to use to use the stun server of Google for Google Hangouts, I can reuse the same shared secret to have all the other web RTC communication as well. So something that is now popping up is you could easily steal bandwidth of other tenants if you have to pay per kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte passing via a turn or via a stun. Or you could actually trigger a DDoS attack because you could instruct a lot of browsers worldwide all to connect with the, set, the same uh, secret to the stun server and, and he can actually be DDoSed quite instantly. But the good news is they are aware of that and ITF is actually having a working group to tackle the whole authentication in stun and turn at this moment. So this is something that will be fixed. Uh, if it's not fixed, I actually imagine that a lot of problems will happen once you can read out the shared secrets. Other thing that you can do, you could of course also attack the, the basic infrastructure of SIP or all the infrastructure that are coupled to WebRTC. Um, this is something that we might see in the near future as well, that more uh, researchers will find security problems in SIP because now they're much more open to a broader audience of web, RT, uh, web clients connecting to the SIP uh, uh, gateway. And you could do that via the signaling server, you could do that via the browser, you could do that directly as well. So wrap up. Um, we saw some flexibility versus security. So um, because of the many variations, a lot of things can happen in how you deploy WebRTC, but it's very hard to say is it secure or not, because depending on how you say the different stakeholders are involved in setting up IDPs, signaling server, how many peers are connected, it's very hard to make a general comment. So in that sense, I just want to give you a flavor of what do you have to think if you're integrating that in your own architecture. Some of the specifications are very open. Signaling part, IDPs, I think we already discussed this before. This is something that might also cause some problems because it's underspecified or the responsibilities are not clear for the website, what he has to do or what the browser has to do. The permission model, we already discussed what the problems are with the permission model. Uh, what are the impact that we have on existing applications? I hope by now, because we show some examples, you could trigger fingerprints, you could set all, all of a sudden set up automatic peer-to-peer -peer connections and so on, that actually the attack surface of even existing applications that di didn't think about WebRTC might be affected. For instance, even if you say, uh, now all of a sudden, or visiting a malicious website, it's actually exploiting software on your client side. It might exfiltrate data over a peer-to-peer -peer connection just by using basic browser infrastructure. And this is something that we might not have believed before, that the browser could actually set up that peer-to-peer -peer connection even behind firewalls, behind NOTs, just as part of the JavaScript APIs. So when a cross-site scripting vulnerability in your web application might have much more uh, impact than it had before. 
Also, if you have already streams or you have already video in, as part of your application, all of a sudden that can be rerouted to other endpoints as well without you being notified for that. So also peer-to-peer, -peer, when people hear peer-to-peer, -peer, they think about we get much more privacy, but think about the signaling server being involved in eavesdropping, IDP can do eavesdropping, a lot of different vendors might actually see some of the metadata. So the peer-to-peer -peer might offer you more privacy, but you have to think about how the thing is set up before you actually can create that privacy enhancement. So taking home, I already mentioned, limit the number of third-party libraries in your local installation of WebRTC. So put it in a different domain, and you probably don't need a lot of third-party libraries to be included in that origin. Use the identity provider in order to get that endpoint authentication as part of your WebRTC. Use best practices, but this is actually obvious. Think about the, the screen sharing pretty well and follow up what happens in the near future with that, with that extension. But most important, embrace the new technology because I really think it's a really cool technology and you shouldn't be scared of it. You really should think about how it's integrated in your application. And if you do it carefully, it can actually offer you a lot of benefits. Uh, no. Yeah. Wait. So, so here you're using UDP, but UDP is already open because if you're doing DNS, you're already using UDP. Yeah. If you're allowed from your home network to open up UDP connections to the outside world, it will be allowed. And in most cases, it will be already the case because if you, for instance, have a, a custom DNS server client, a custom DNS client, it will already open UDP connections. Okay, UDP is uh, Yeah. Know, UDP. So TCP is typically what is used in a reliable protocol. UDP is actually, if you lose, oh, yeah. No, yeah. Okay. So if you lose a UDP data, uh, datagram, the connection can still go on, and so that's the reason why you use it for streams. Okay. But this will, by default, in most cases work in any network. Okay, and with this, I, I think I better end my presentation because we're going over time. But if you still have more questions, please feel free to, to, to ask them during the break. Thank you.